my name is Victor Enta. I'm a Java champion from Romania. Uh, and eight years ago, I've realized that just writing code wasn't enough for me, and I started doing consultancy and training. Uh, now it became a full-time job for me, so that's what I do for a living. I do workshops and consultancy in different companies throughout Europe on clean code architecture, uh, unit testing, frameworks, uh, performance, and security. This is what I do for a living. Now, uh, if you Google me, you can find a lot of talks that I did online, recorded on YouTube or different conferences. But what I want to bring to your attention is this. Um, I have a community that I started several years ago. It's called um, uh, now European Software Crafters, uh, which is a huge community of people that want to get better at, uh, at, uh, at what we do, at, what we, uh, at our profession. So what happens in this community that I will invite you to all to join? Uh, every month we sit together for one hour and we, um, we talk about different topics after hours, online, on Zoom, completely free. It's very fun. There are hundreds of, usually a hundred of people join and uh, it's, it's a very engaging discussion in there. If you want to have a look, uh, the past events are on my YouTube channel. Right. Besides work, I am a father of two, owner of a cat, and during weekends I try to do a bit of digital detoxing by gardening. OK, modular monolith. Now, what's with the picture, you could ask? On one side, modules. On one side, monolith. Now, who here has been in a terrible monolith? Who here has been in a legacy system, 10 years old, like terrible code? That, yeah, that's an experience you'll never forget. And um, a monolith is uh, famous for uh, being full of very tangled code, very uh, full of dirty patches and fixes everywhere. And it's very slow and risky to change because, yeah, who, who has the courage to do that? And the code base definitely craves for refactoring, but we, no, no one has the courage to touch the code because we usually lack tests in such a system. So in a legacy monolith, the, uh, by the way, and this is the, uh, the de facto architecture for most production systems today, right? So you interact with more legacy monoliths that you can imagine every day. This is what spins the world today, this architecture. Architecture. Now, um, over the past several decades, uh, many IT thought leaders have tried to clean up a bit and to help simplify the, the logic in such a monolith. And for, uh, this, was, this culminated with the clean architecture from Uncle Bob. Who of you here has ever seen this picture before? Oh, that's like half of you. Very fun. And uh, they tried here to protect the domain. They tried to protect what, the complexity of our system. Against who? against the libraries, against the APIs that surround us, against the frameworks, the persistence, the database. Everyone was evil, but the pure business logic was not. And they tried desperately to protect the complexity of our system. But it turns out that a large project will suffer more from internal coupling inside the, the, the domain than from coupling or, or, or uh, uh, the evilness of the libraries and the frameworks that surround us. Right? Libraries have evolved, frameworks have evolved, APIs that we call, microservices that we call in our ecosystems, they, are, they have nice APIs, nice. Uh, it's, it's not, the problem is not that anymore. Because if you defend the domain, nothing keeps that domain from growing enormously. This is sometimes referred to as domain dilution, meaning they're trying to solve many problems in the same code base. That and that and that and patching. Right? The, the, the cohesion decreases, the coupling gets wild, and in the end you end up with a 100,000 lines of code monolith that uh, uh, is full of business rules that no one can untangle. Right? So coming to the rescue, uh, microservices came. Microservices said what? Break stuff into different systems. What happened next? You get faster time to market. And that's what many of the customers that I have are concerned of. Deploying a monolith and having an idea, the time it takes until you have the idea and you put it to production is very long. It's very hard and risky and slow to deploy a monolith. So microservices grant you the ability to iterate faster, they say. They, they grant you the ability to have smaller teams. Improve scalability. Why? Because if one part of your application wants to scale, wants to, has to take a lot of heat, you can just rip this off in a microservice, scale it on seven machines, and you're done, right? Or fault tolerance. One microservice can go down, but the others, which are very critical, like place order, those might remain up. So it's very important. Um, for such situations, microservices are really, really the thing. 
And then microservices allow you to play with different technologies. That's very, you can't really mix Kotlin, Java, C Sharp in, in the same code base, but microservices allow you to do that. Also, since the dawn of GDPR, data security is really a thing, an annoying thing. So you, then you have to wonder, where do I put the customer information? What do I do with the personal information? How do I store it? If you store it in a, in a, in a shared database, in a, in a monolith, anything can go wrong. Any, any, any part of the code can leak that information out. So what you do, you get the data from the, for the customer, and you put it in a well-defined, clearly defined microservice. Huh? Easier to audit, easier to, to, uh, to, uh, to analyze. Right. But microservices come with a huge price. The moment you play network, you need to think of delays, you need to think of retries, item potency, load balancing, distributed cache, resilience, load distributed load, Kubernetes, and all that. that. It's a very high, very high price to pay. So then the customers that I have, they are, were looking at their monoliths. They were dreaming about microservices and said, OK, how do we go there? They first tried to Big Bang rewrite the whole system. Like blew it up completely, gathered requirements for one and a half year. I was part of such a project. They gathered requirements for one and a half year. And after they did that, they started from scratch. And, but then any change that came to the old system, it, it either had to be delayed or doubled the effort because they have to implement it in the old and the new one. And after such a terrible investment, statistics showed that the success ratio is disappointing. So even if you struggle and you pay that, it won't help. And you know what's, what's the worst part? Even if you succeed, you might end up, it's, you often do, with a distributed monolith, which is the worst of, of all worlds, in which you have tightly coupled microservices that you cannot really evolve independently. You need to deploy as a whole, all, all of them together. That's the worst of all worlds. Right? Why, why does this happen? Because it didn't take time to analyze the coupling inside that legacy monolith. And you jump on microservices like the, the best new thing. Other companies that I work with, they tried, the, they tried to implement all the new features in new microservices that sit, be, be, uh, that sit in front of the monolith and then pull into those new microservices as much complexity they can progressively from the monolith. That works. That works perfectly, but it won't be able to break the kernel of that monolith. Any, any decent one million lines of code monolith we, we face has a kernel of complexity. You can't just break that part with, with, this, te with this technique. You need something else. So what can we do? We can progressively modularize the code base first into modules, see how they look, decouple the data, decouple the logic, and if it makes sense, move on to microservices if we must, if we see any benefit in doing that. So modular monoliths are a safe transitioning step from legacy monolith into microservices. You will take the code base and make it into modules. You will see what modules are in a moment. But that's not all. That's not the only use case of a, mo of a, of a, mod of a modular monolith. What do you think is faster to build from scratch? So if you had to, a clear set of requirements and that you have to get done in one year, what do you think will get you faster there? Building a monolith or three microservices? What do you think about that? Microservices? No, all is the monolith. Monolith is faster to build from scratch. In the first year, the, in the honeymoon of, of, of a monolith, everything is super fine. It's super easy. It's super easy to refactor inside. So the monolith is easy to build at first, but then it grows. And when it grows, stuff is not fun anymore, right? So what happens in practice is that initially the velocity, the productivity that we have of building a monolith, a monolith is very high, but then it drops. It drops due to the uh, coupling that grows inside, to the complexity we pile up, and the patches, and the uh, rushing, and not refactoring. This drops at some point. Now, microservices, on the other hand, they have a slow start, a slower start, because you have to pay all that overhead of governance, of deploying those distributed systems. But then, the, on the long run, they end up faster, because the, the loosely coupling that they promote, it will help you maintain a sustainable pace on the long run. But that's basic science, right? I mean, like, but wait, the, here comes a guy who says, wait, but I have a very complex system. If I have a very complex system, can I start with microservices directly? No. 
the community disagrees with that opinion. I mean, like, the, the, the idea could make sense. Say, hey, if I, if I know I'm going to go very, very complex, can I start with microservices, that, that microservices directly? It could seem like a good idea, but it's a bad idea. And I've seen that in many clients, in many companies in Romania. Started with three microservices, developing for six months or nine months, and ending the development. If you end the development in nine months, that code base is 50,000 lines of code. Why do you have three systems? I asked them, and they said, uh, it's cool. So you should not start with microservices from scratch. No, even if you know your, your application will grow big. Why? Because you don't want to rush to take the decision what to distribute. So the point is to start simple and to observe the natural bottlenecks of your system, to see where stuff gets complex or where the heat goes, and take that part and extract it out as microservices. So the modular monolith is not only for transitioning a, a, a legacy monolith, but can be actually a, a target architecture at, start, at the start. We want to go there. We want to have a monolith at the beginning. But wait, why should we have to decide? Why should we have to decide whether we go for a monolith or for microservices? Why can't we have the best of both worlds? Why can't we keep the simplicity of a monolith in terms of deployment to have a single physical thing, a single, a single thing is physical uh, 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 deployment, a single, a single code base, a single build pipeline, but have inside of it the logical architecture of microservices? And then, if we ever want to rip off a module in a separate microservice, we can do that by extracting a module into a microservice if we see benefit in doing that. So what am I talking about here? Modular monolith, basically. This is a solution. This is the way to go for new systems. Like, we build that, and you modularize it, and then we extract those microservices. This is very trendy style of architectures. I'm not sure if you, if you realize, but the honeymoon, the microservice honeymoon, is over. People are not just, hey, microservices everywhere. No, people started taking more elaborate decisions. And this is on the table of many architects today on many, on many design decisions. In short, this is modulus. But let's see, what, what, what happens inside? You see, modulus, what happens inside? Let's take an example. In a legacy monolith, imagine an eShop, everything that has to do with buying stuff is inside the code base storing data in a shared, m huge database, hundreds of tables inside. If we go to microservices, that would mean separate deployment units, each with its own private database, like uh, product management, or order fulfillment, payment, customer, right? separate deployments with their own databases. Now, how does a modular monolith look like? A modular monolith will have in the same code base different modules cleanly defined between them, usually storing data in a single shared database. OK, so what happens next? The dream. The dream is the following. The dream is that you have, and I've, I have five or six uh, clients, companies that I work with, that I do trainings at, that, uh, that do this, that have started from the beginning with this idea that we want to build a, mod, uh, a monolith, a single, pro a single project, but that project should have modules on which, and that's the best part, separate teams can work. <laughs> separate teams. Not a whole bunch of stuff. Not 20 people in the same Git. Separate teams, each working on their modules. And they talk to each other once every two weeks. And it works. That's the dream. That's, that's the holy grail of, of the modules. If you don't need microservices, stick to modules, but pay attention to how you draw the boundaries. So first, we'll get you there. What is a module? It helps a lot if you think of a module like a logical application, like a full logical application, including the front end. So the same way um, microservices are best built with micro front ends, with full stack teams that implement the back end and the front end for that piece of behavior, the same for modules. A team working on a module should be responsible for the backend logic and the front end. The same. It's absolutely the same. I won't talk about front ends again, but just to mention this. So you can still do full stack, each with its own area. Uh, of course, if you start from scratch, if you have a legacy monolithic uh, web page, like the website, you can't really break that very easy. So you will, you will stick with that for a while. So how does a, how does a module look inside? 
The, the fun thing about this architecture is that every module can have a different architecture, can decide what architecture they want to use. For example, you might stick to a traditional layered architecture. Why? Because you have a mid-junior team that is not really comfortable with architecture, and the problem you are solving is not that complicated. So do that. Or perhaps you want to go to for, a, for a concentric architecture that protects the domain from the outside world, like domain-driven style, because you want to start modeling aggregates and consistency and rich domains and stuff like that for complex problems. Or perhaps you fancy, oh, and by the way, if you ever think of playing a um, concentric architecture, ports adapters, hexagonal, uh, clean architecture, or onion, please check that uh, video over there. It's a video containing tricks to uh, make it, uh, to avoid over-engineering. Uh, Onion architecture has been famous for causing a lot, or has become famous for causing a lot of over-engineering. And I've met lead architects saying that Onion, ew, a lot of garbage. Useless abstractions, too many interfaces, a lot of big garbage. Check that. So no one really does Onion by the book, by the article by that image at the beginning. No one does that anymore. We simplify that uh, to suit our needs. Uh, or you could go for a, uh, for a fancy vertical slice architecture. This is, a, this, is very, this is trendy these days. It's the idea to group code not by technical layers, but by the features they implement, the, the, um, the use cases that you, you have to do. So for example, place order would group the classes having to do with place order, estimate shipping, uh, shipping, uh, shipping costs. Those will be grouped not by layers, but by verticals, okay? uh, vertical slice architecture, really trendy. You, can, you have the freedom to choose what architecture you want. That's the beauty. Right? But modules have their own challenges, like any other. Defining the boundaries, establishing how they communicate, and ensuring the data they have it is not depending on each other. It's, it's, it's independent from one another. Now, in the next section, pay attention, because everything that we talk about is directly applicable to microservices. So f uh, architecture. Architecture is the art of drawing lines. What does that mean? It means drawing boundaries, deciding what should stick together and what should be broken apart. It's probably one of the most complicated questions in architecture. Should those two things stick together or not? Or should I separate infrastructure from domain? Should I separate shipping from, uh, from, from pricing? Right? Now, that's the uh, uh, traditional. Do you have this? Have you ever seen this? Controller, service, repo, anyone? It's like the default, right? I mean, like, you should all have seen this. This is the default. When I go to projects, this is what I see every time. Packages, grouping code by technical layers, OK? Um, OK, it's fine for a small monolith, it works. It's actually a good idea to allow a bit of freedom and just group stuff like that, because it's very easy. A junior can do this, no problem. Oh, it's a controller. It has less controller. OK, in the controller package. Oh, it's a service. OK, service. It's, it's super easy to do. But in time, code will grow. And when it grows, in order to, to make your life easier and group the code better, you might end up breaking the packages into sub-packages behind, like product, order. And maybe services grow big, right? And at some point, you would realize that all the code you have groups itself by another axis that, than technical layers. So what do you do next? One day, you flip the order of the packages. <laughs> and then you get goosebumps and, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. We were actually building multiple things, not a single project. This is when you realize that your application has grown too big. All right. This is when you realize that uh, having a, sh a single monolithic code base is not enough. You have to take action. So what can you do? Of course, separate modules. And the first thing you could do is to just take the order and the product and put them uh, like modules uh, and say, hey, behold the order module. Behold the invoice module. Behold the product module. And that's a good starting point. Starting point. It's not very mature. Why? Grouping. <laughs> Grouping code by data they refer to was never a good idea for non-trivial domains. This won't get you too far. If, your prob if the problems you have to solve are, 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 are non-trivial, this won't get you too far. It's better to group not by data, but by the capability that they offer to the clients by the value they bring to your customers. What value, what, what, what does it help me to do? 
right? Order fulfillment, invoicing, and the catalog, not the product, but the area of business, okay? It's always preferable. Also, also in microservices, the same would apply. That's the beauty. We are talking about modules, but I'm actually talking about microservices. It's, it's the same thing. So let's take a simple example. If I have customer in product, customer would have first name, last name, and status, like genius, for example. Product would have a name and description and the price. If you group stuff by data, this is what you get. But it turns out, I mean, like, of course you will take the customer-related information and put it in one module, and the product-related stuff, the details, put it in another module. That's, that's a, that, that's a no-brainer. The question lies, what do you do with the price? Because the price is tightly related with the status. You get some price if you are a genius level four. You get a different price if you are genius level one. So, or if you are a gold member, I don't know. So those two things, if you separate by concept, you will end up, when you compute the price, doing a lot of traffic and querying. And that's actually the business value that you want to bring to your, to your, to your domain, to your business, the pricing. So what do you do? You take the customer status, you take the price, and you say that is actually pricing. So what happens next? The, uh, you, you could ask that pricing module, hey, can you give me, please, the price for this customer? And the pricing says, yeah, sure, that's the price. Why? Because it knows, it knows the, um, uh, the status of the customer and is able to compute the price without querying, without asking anyone. You gain independence and you orient stuff by the business capability. So the module, the module is not just a function. The module is not just a, not just data. If it's just a behavior, put, a, put there a class. If it's just data, that's not a module. And a warning point here, if you just have to provide some, some country data to all the application, you don't need the country module. That's wrong. I would go for a country repository in the shared module. <laughs> the shared module. And everything that's shared in a large architecture is dubious. But still, static data doesn't deserve a module. I don't care, it's just boring data. It's a table, I never change anything. I just query it, right? So that kind of stuff doesn't deserve to be a full-fledged module, right? So again, the module is a technical authority for, the, for a business capability. It is not product, but catalog. OK. Now, when it, com when it comes to, to, um, to boundaries, we need to mention this book. Domain-driven design 20 years ago has changed the way we think about software design forever. And it probably one of the most important concepts in the book is uh, the bounded context. So super simplifying the idea is uh, a boundary within which a domain model helps you, is applicable. It comes from the idea that if, if you have a model trying to serve 200,000 lines of code, that model will end up just having getters and setters, anemic, just carrying data. It won't help you. You will you will open your entity, it has 45 fields, God bless you. That's not helping, right? It, it, you can't use that entity in any smart way, you will just treat it like a bag of data. The main driven design puts it in a, in a twist it and says, why don't you break the model harder so that the structures that you involve in building your complexity are smaller, and then you can make them more tailored for your problem. You can make them help you. You can enforce constraints. You can put behavior inside. Right? That's a very, very, and if you never read, read that book, please do read it. Um, clean code book, refactoring, second edition, domain-driven design. These are must-read book for any software engineer. So the smaller the boundary, the more helpful the model can be. OK, so then the next obvious question is, how big should the module be? OK, you told us, by business capability. OK, OK, Small, the smaller, the better the, the structures help you. But then how big should the module be? Uh, question, folks. Do you, uh, do you guys know what PTSD means? PTSD? Post-traumatic. Post-traumatic. <laughs> right. If, uh, if there is anyone coming from a terrible monolith, millions of lines of code, they will definitely choose, not small, but even smaller. They will tell you, make them tiny, make them super. Why? Because out of pain. Those guys wake up in the middle of the night screaming because of the code they've, they've seen when they were young, right? And now they just want to run away from that. And that's the next pitfall you can fall. 
I took Uber to come here today. This is Uber. These are the microservices of Uber before they realized what the mess they did. And they started merging them back into a more manageable solution. These are microservices. This is wrong. This is, this is bullshit. This is cutting too small. And they are now merging them back to say, wait, 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 wait. That, that's madness, no. Again, larger services, not that tiny, right? So that's the fallacy here. If you go for super, super tiny modules, you will end up with a hell of interaction between those modules. So the smaller the complexity on a local scale goes, the, more you, the, 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 the finer you cut, the more you have to work to put things back together to integrate all, the, all of the pieces. Right? And that's a drama. The global complexity will become insane. And you will end up having also modules that uh, have very wide APIs. A lot, of, a lot of noise, a lot of chatter between those modules. That's not what you want to go. And I've seen that mistake in one of my clients. A module with 45 modules. I was like, what the heck is that? They were scrolling the package structure to see all the projects. What are you doing in there? I'm scrolling. What the heck? That's not the point. <laughs> And they said, yeah, we know, we know, we are merging them back. OK. So what's the solution to this? Coming back to the basics of coupling and cohesion. You see, on one side, cohesion, aiming for high cohesion, tells you to break stuff that doesn't belong together, to go for smaller chunks, for smaller code. Chop classes apart, modules, break microservices, smaller, smaller, smaller. On the other hand, coupling refrains you from going too hard. Because the smaller you slice, the more coupling you have between the pieces. So these forces are orthogonal somehow. Cohesion tells you break, break, break. Coupling says, wait a second, look at the APIs. How much, how much traffic, how much discussion do you have between those pieces? Too much. Well, merge back, please. So it's this game between coupling and cohesion that 30 years old still plays the game today. So what I want you to do, folks, is to be brave. And keep it simple, keep it stupid simple, and wait for the complexity. When the complexity grows, extract the module. Only then. Don't rush to break it into pieces too early. I, I forgot to put something on the, on the screen. Usually, you can survive with a monolith more than a year without having any worries. In the first year, it's like, yee baby, no problem. When you pass a certain point, the complexity starts slowing you down. When that happens, look around and, try and start asking the question, what's the responsibility of the code? What modules can I delineate? Right. And that's basically what people are talking about when they say uh, evolutionary architecture. Take it baby steps and evolve the design. And that's a practice from Agile. That's a practice from the Agile in 2001. That's a practice from Agile that software craftsmanship tries to revigorate, tries to resuscitate. The idea that the architecture should not be set up front, but evolved progressively. And one point of my community is just that, basically explaining people and debating how we can, we can achieve this. Good. Now, the second challenge of modules is how do they communicate? Now, of course, once you cut the module invoicing, you don't want all the, any other module to access the internals of that module. So any call from outside should be blocked, should say, no, wait, what, where are you going? That's an internal class, not allowed. And you can do that using two techniques. You can use the compiler, like most teams that go for modules do, and put uh, the different modules into separate compilation units. right? And then the compiler will tell you, where are you going? You don't see that. How can you, you, don't see the you don't see the classes you are, you are trying to, to, to access. right? Or you, can, you, you could rely on unit tests. And that is growing. Uh, that, that practice is really growing. Uh, when, when I say relying on unit tests, I, I mean tests that look like this. Slices that match my app anything, here, anything, should not depend on each other. Isn't that cute? Except the stuff that goes to the shared module or to the public API of another module. Isn't that cute? And that's a unit test breaking on Jenkins. Yeah. If someone crosses the boundary, build failed. Cute. And there are equivalents in all the languages. So uh, you see, unit tests to check. The, um, Neil Ford 
mentions this as fitness functions in evolutionary architectures book. This is something big. This is growing. Looking, uh, uh, analyzing the code for, uh, for unwanted dependencies and guarding those, right? You don't necessarily need 25 Maven modules. Now, of course, every module, as you, as you foresaw, has a public API that others can call. It's, they are free to call anything in the public API. And the public API basically allows other events to call methods inside and allows the module A to throw events out. And this is the way modules communicate. Calls and events. Did anyone say REST calls and message queues? It's the same thing. Microservices and modules are basically using the same techniques, the same design principles. It's just it's super more simple if you go for modules than microservices. Let's see what, what else. The public API, a part of the public API exposed to other modules would be exposed to the outside world also, like REST endpoints and message listeners. Or, or, or publishing messages. This, so the, a part of the public API is actually external for other systems, right? But not all. Most of the, most of the, uh, uh, of the API of a module should be kept private inside the, mono, the, the monolithic code base. Only those things useful for the external should be exposed in external API. I mean, that's, that's pretty neat. And if there is a public API to a, to a module that then is, needs to be exposed outside, you can just take it from here and put it there. Three annotations, you're done. OK, so calls. Calls between modules are extremely, extremely simple. They don't evolve network. They are super fast, and they are just calls. You can control, click, and you get to the other module, done. Imagine trying to, to, to understand what happens on the other side of a network call on, in another microservice. See how you have to clone that code base to see what they are doing. Control click, done. If you want. Usually, you should not jump so very much between modules. But if, if, you, if you need to, you can. And methods. Methods, uh, the methods and objects involved in a call should, of course, be part of the public API. You don't want to leak out uh, internal classes of the module out, don't. So basically, I'm talking about data transfer objects, separate data structures, and a dedicated class, an API class, that is used by, by outside, from outside. Great, right. Besides calls, we have events. What do, the, what do these mean? Now, before we, we jump on, events, of course, the same. They, the structure they have, the event classes themselves, they need to be part of the public API, right? They are part of your contract, of the contract of the module. Now, events compared to calls, have a series of advantages and disadvantages. First of all, of course, they are more decoupled. The one that fires an event doesn't have to wait or even to know about who is listening to those events. And then tomorrow, a new module might plug into listening to the same event. Nothing would change in the code base. Now, events are, uh, are cool because they don't, events don't bring any result back to the publisher. Once you publish an event, it's gone. You don't need to, you don't want anything back. It's just a, a signal and, and, and done. Because of that, you can run those events asynchronously, or you can even store them somewhere. Right? Isn't that cool? But of course, events have their own weaknesses. They are not suitable if you want to implement a request reply. It's very cumbersome to, uh, if you want to continue doing something after a reply event comes back. There is no such thing like a reply event, but still, it's very cumbersome if you want to do a, if you need some result back from who you publish to. So it's not a, once, it's not a, it's not a silver bullet, it's all, it has its own weaknesses. And if you play events within the same code base, I've seen teams with the modular monoliths that said no to this because the code becomes much harder to navigate. If you control click a method, you get to the implementation. If you have an event, you have to somehow see who registers to listen to this. It's much more complicated than navigating with the method call. And as an implementation, detail events can be of two types. can be notifications, just carrying the ID, or can be heavy events carrying data. And the same discussion 100% applies for microservices. Right? That's, that's the fun part. You can tweak these design ideas in a single modular, uh, in, in a single code base, uh, and if you want to change your mind from a call to an event, you can do that in one hour. Uh, now, uh, uh, these, the communication between modules also has its own dark stories. 
What happens if two modules call each other? A calls B, B calls A. What happens then? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's called the cyclic dependency. And if you are using separate build modules, the build will fail. Maven Grader will just say, hey, what, what are you doing? This doesn't compile. You can't do cyclic dependencies between modules. So wow, what do you do? We will see in the following six ways to fix cyclic dependencies. That's the hardest part of the discussion today. Six ways to fix cyclic dependencies. And while we dis discuss that, we will understand also the strategic relationship between different modules. Let's, let's dive in. First of all, if you just want to make the build pass, if you just want to make the build pass, what you can do is to extract an API module, another module. Yeah, one more module for, uh, for one free round of beer for everyone. Every module now has another API module in front of them. You just double the, the number of Maven build artifacts. Congratulations. You don't have 23, you have 46. And these are real numbers. So then you have an API module that you can depend freely that contains the interfaces and probably the data structures. And you can all depend on each other's IP APIs without having any cycle dependency ever. But that's a bit of cheating. Because if you have uh, two modules depending on each other intimately like this, calling each other, that means that when you change one, you usually change the other, and vice versa. It's a tight coupling between the two modules. And you, you could ask the question at some point, isn't it better to, to, to let the two modules stick together back? Couldn't I merge back the two modules? I'm talking about having two modules and then merging them back in a single one. That takes three days, two days in a modular monolith. It will take you one sprint if they, these were microservices. What I'm talking about here, changing minds about boundaries, it's much cheaper in a modular monolith. Right? You just have to be refactor in a, in a wild weekend, you're done. Right? And Monday, everything is fine. The modules are squashed together, no problem. In a microservice, that's a team effort. That, that's, a, that's a milestone, right? merging two services back. So consider this. Consider this between modules that are very tightly coupled to each other. Now, we mentioned events. So here is one other kind of, uh, of interaction. What if one module just has to react to the changes happening in another module? What would then happen? If you just want to find out when something happened in the other module, you would subscribe to an event thrown by that module. Make sense? You would just listen to an event. Just subscribe and you're done. Uh, and that basically frees B from knowing about A. B doesn't give a shit. B will just fire an event. Who wants to listen? Listen. Who doesn't? I don't care. Right? So it, it, gets you, it gets B more decoupled. And it also broke the cycle dependency. A can call B, and B can notify A, but without being coupled to it. It will just fire an event. Done. Good. Now, if you are in this game because you came from a legacy monolith, from a one million line of code terror code base, you might have behind you a legacy website, like an, a monolithic, a monolithic um, um, uh, front-end, which wants, or maybe some, some monolithic API that, wants to, that, that, that clients are using and they, that, that, that have to provide information coming from different modules. What do you do then? What do you do if you have to provide data from different modules in the same API? I will tell you what you'll do. You should leave behind a facade like a, an entry point that will delegate the stuff to the modules behind. And I, again, I've seen that happening in practice in two clients. They left behind an API or a site module calling the different parts they decoupled behind. Now, of course, ideally, you should not need this facade, this API module. You should have the clients call directly the external API of A or, or B. But that's a transitioning phase. Later, you could do that. You could take one API that you had in here, break it into pieces, and turn this into two separate calls to the, to the external APIs of the modules. You can go there progressively. You don't need to big bang anyone. Right. right. 
Now, there is one more famous example in which two modules have to use the same functionalities to send an email, for example. Something technical, something that doesn't have to do with the business logic of either of them. In that case, it's a common practice to extract a shared module. I told you about it. No one really ex escapes the shared module in this case. You have to have some sort of glue code, some sort of boring utilities that is, are used everywhere. But please keep inside here only technical stuff. Don't pile up domain knowledge inside C. There, there should be nothing having to do with A or B inside C. Nothing, nothing business, just technical stuff. OK, now there is one more option to integrate modules, which is very, very magical, esoteric, very, very wild and mysterious. Um, and it, it, it refers to using polymorphism for making one side unaware of the other. That is sometimes called dependency inversion principle. You bas basically put an interface in one of the modules, and you implement it in the other. What? That's, if you read into the Onion architectures, you know what this is. You keep an interface in one part, and you implement it on the other side. And you, the, thus, you make that part, this, unaware of the other. So you can draw a line and say B doesn't have a clue about A, doesn't know about A. A will just obey the contract that B prescribed. I've seen that once. They pulled out some terrible logic, financial markers logic, from B into A. A, you wouldn't believe it. You had to get two weeks, eight hours a day training before you joined Project A. You had to be a financial guru to enter, to have the right commit on Project A. You have to know business, but two weeks of business, it was like, yeah, we joined the project. And they wanted to have a dedicated team just working on A. So they pulled everything that had to do with these financial indicators and they pulled it in A, you see? So anyone could call behavior in A, but those that entered A, they had like an aura behind them. They were like entering, like they were, they were shining. Yeah, those guys knew stuff. The others didn't have to have a clue. Just call the method, they're done. Uh, it, not so common technique, OK? Now, um, these are ways that you can um, uh, break, basically, uh, a cyclic dependency. Again, to recap, you could extract an API module and have each basically fix the build um, you could publish an event to the other, right? And it will decouple A from, it will decouple B from knowing about A. You could extract the utilities, uh, commons. You could keep an entry point, a shared entry point, delegating to the to the lower level modules. You could merge them back into uh, into, in, uh, into a single module, or you could use the polymorphism interfaces to uh, to uh, to do the trick. All right. So basically, a module has this surface that can receive calls, that can take events or publish events, and can expose interfaces that others can implement. And these are all the ways there are. Right? Pick one. You know? And then a module, a part of that public API becomes external. Becomes external and can be exposed to remote systems. Here. So this is basically the surface of a module in a modular monolith. Right? This is what goes in and out. Inside the module, you can have layers, onions, whatever you want, vertical slices, right? But what, from what you see from outside is just this, just the surface. Cool. Now, one, the, the last pain point about uh, modulates is what happens uh, with data. Data, every module should be responsible for the data it owns. You should not have a module querying the tables of another module. That's not fair. Right? That will break the encapsulation. So instead, one module should go, knock on the door, and ask for the data of the other module. You should not just query the database. But of course, life is cruel. So if you come from a legacy monolith, this is where you start. You, you start with shared access, read, write, to the tables. So what, goes, what happens next? Next, you want to protect the tables and have them only written by one module. So they will have like, uh, this is called write isolation. You have tables ac uh, uh, updated by one single module. Next level would be to go to the previous side and say table isolation, a table with never ever accessed in any way but by the module it owns, that owns it. And typically that comes together with separate schemas. Modules would have their own separate schemas. Fourth level that is already dangerous is to break the consistency, which means that in the same transaction, you should not update two tables of different modules. 
It means that you drop the foreign keys between those schemas. Don't do this. One big advantage of the, if you watched Kevin, three orders, four orders, eventual consistency, why pay that price? Why play that game? If you can have acid transactionality of your database, why? Why pay that price if you don't have to? So I would, I would sacrifice consistency just, just before I, I plan to extract one module as a microservice. Just that. Keep the transactionality and uh, consistency of the database for as long as you can. Right? These are basically the stuff that I've seen in practice in different stages of evolution. Good. Now, one word about testing. Testing a monolith was all, is much easier, much cheaper than testing 10 microservices. You can just boot up the whole project, put it, uh, connect it to a, to a Docker with a database, and there you go. Right? Wire mock rounds, and you're done. Or you can, uh, but then you also have integration tests that need to span a single module. If you want to write these kind of tests, I would advise you read into Spring Modulus. There is Spring Framework support for, being, for building modular monoliths. It's still in experimental status, but it's very interesting to inspire <coughs> and copy code from. Good. So what, is, what, are the, what are the pain points I've seen, and what, what, are, what should we keep in mind? Invest more time to clarify module boundaries. That will pay off enormously. Think very carefully, what you, do you want to separate? Does it have a clearly defined responsibility? Is it big enough? Does it have a small API? Okay. Consider merging the modules that end up talking too much to each other. Don't sacrifice consistency too early. You want those foreign keys. You want that transaction that gets you a good night's sleep. Right? Carefully design the data that moves out and in of a module, and don't ever leak internal classes out in your public API. And the last point. You should monitor the architecture using ArcUnit or any other fitness function uh, to make sure you, are, or you keep on track. Right? So the, hit, the, the hot question at the end, last slide, when should you choose a modulate? When you migrate from a legacy monolith, it's the safest step. When you start a Greenfield project, in the, um, in the first one or two years, things are not yet clear where they grow complex. Let it grow a bit. Right. A system that, has, uh, that is never supposed to take a lot of heat or never supposed to grow enormously complex. If you know beforehand that, modules are, are, are a very good solution. Microservices. Arguably, if you want to ship very, very frequently the, the, the behavior, go for microservices. But I've seen, I have a client in Serbia that deploys the modular monolith every week in production. 25 developers, five teams in the same code base. Every week in production, they, I know microservices that deploy every six months. All as a whole, 20 microservices at once. That's not good. Fault tolerance and scalability. Of course, if you want to scale one part enormously or you want to be able to survive a crash in one part, microservices. If you want to experiment Kotlin or something else, right? Or for security reasons, if you want to take the data which is critical and keep aside. This is the status quo right now in architecture trends about modules. Are not the silver bullet either, but they work. I have clients in Serbia, London, um, what about Germany, uh, Romania that are building modules and are super happy with them. So, happy decisions, but don't forget that if you have a great team, that great team will build a great system, whatever choice you do. So you could choose microservices. You won't succeed with microservices because of microservices. You would succeed because you had a great team. So don't, don't ignore this factor. And with that, I thank you all. Uh, two, three things here. Um, if you want to deep dive into these topics, there is a webinar coming up that I will do uh, on May 29. I will invite you all to join the community over here. And if you want to know more about the stuff that I do for companies, th there is a QR for you there if you want to scan. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Yeah, told you. And there are stickers. There are stickers on that table. Grab a sticker. Stickers. Now that's stickers. energy, right? Yeah. So, Victor, thank you once again for being here.